Hello everyone and welcome to the 8th episode of the PowerShell video series. Wow, that's a lot of episodes. We are nearing the end of the series now. In this episode, we're going to take a look at taking our scripts even further, using things known as if statements, as well as covering a few other bits and pieces along the way. Before we get back into scripting, however, I'd just like to quickly go over one thing we've been using a lot in our time with PowerShell, but haven't really taken a closer look at yet, and that's operators. What is an operator? Well, it's this thing here. Remember how inside where we can write dash EQ and stuff to compare two things? Well, that dash EQ there is what we call an operator. And remember how you can add numbers or strings or whatever together like this? Well, this plus is an operator. All an operator is, is essentially a thing built into the language that allows you to perform a specific action of some kind on some objects. Not all operators come in the same form as dash EQ and plus, where you have one thing on the left and one thing on the right. Another operator we've been using a lot is casting. Those square brackets with text in the middle make up a casting operator. Or another example of an operator we've been using a lot is dot. This operator lets us access a smaller member, and two colons lets us access static members under a type. All of these things are operators. And all of these operators can be used anywhere we want. You probably remember from a few episodes ago. You see this dash EQ operator here? We could put this anywhere. I could literally just write it out on its own. It doesn't have to be in aware. Operators are just their own thing you can do whenever. They're technically completely unrelated to where or anything like that. So, what are all the operators? Well, there are a lot for all kinds of different things, and I'm not going to go through all of them. There's no need to anyway. You'll just discover new ones as you go along using PowerShell anyway, so it doesn't even matter. There is a list of all of them in the description if you really want to take a look through them all, but I wouldn't recommend it. Just learn naturally as you go along using PowerShell. Let's start with some of the basic ones we already know. The comparison operators. These are designed to let us compare two objects in some way and get a boolean back saying whether the comparison matched or not. The simplest comparison operator is dash EQ, which we've used a lot throughout this series. This checks if the thing on the left and the thing on the right are exactly the same. Not slightly the same, not the same except the stars, exactly the same. And there's also dash NE. This stands for not equal to, and it's essentially the opposite to dash EQ. If the two things are not the same, it will give true. And if they are the same, it will give false. So it's the other way around from dash EQ. Now, there is one important thing you need to keep in mind about these two. I can compare integers with dash EQ, and this will compare the two correctly. And I can compare strings, and this will compare the two correctly, and so on. But the reason why it compares the strings and integer objects correctly is not by magic. String objects and integer objects have certain methods on them that PowerShell will call to do the comparison. So if I go to compare two strings, the way PowerShell knows if these two are the same is by calling a comparison method all string objects have on them. That then goes in and does all the necessary stuff with the length and the character data and all that to compare the two. And most types you're going to be comparing are going to have said methods on them so they do compare correctly. However, and it is quite rare, but it may happen that you could encounter a type of object that does not have these comparison methods on them. And when you have an object like that, trying to do dash EQ on it may not work as you expect. For example, let's quickly make our own object, just our own custom object with our own properties. To do that, we're going to make a hash table, put in some items with what properties we want, and then cast it over to PS custom object. So, there's one object there with a property called P and the value of 5 in it. And let's make a second object that also has a property called P and the value of 5 in it. Now, these objects we just made have no methods on them. Well, they have a few methods on them that every type has, like get type and stuff. But beyond the basic stuff everything has, they don't have any extra methods on them, and that includes the comparison method dash EQ runs. It's just not there on the object. 
So, what does dash eq do when we compare two objects that don't have a comparison method on them? Well, let's try comparing these two objects we made and see what happens. So, we're going to compare the first object here and the second object. And you'll see it gave me false. Which is interesting because both of these objects have exactly the same properties with exactly the same values in them. They both look identical, and yet dash eq is saying they're not. The reason why this is happening is when a type doesn't provide a proper comparison method, what dash eq does is it doesn't look at anything inside the object. It doesn't look at the properties or the data in it, all dash eq looks at is the object itself. And what it does is it checks whether the thing on the left and the thing on the right are exactly the same object in memory or not. These two are not exactly the same object. They both have the same stuff in them, yes. They both represent the same thing, but that doesn't mean they're the same object. These are two different objects. We made them separately, so dash eq gives false. Now, if we set b to a, then it's a different story. What we've now done is taken the object in a, the exact same object we have in a, and we put it into b as well. So now, both variables contain exactly the same object, and if we run dash eq now, you'll see it's giving true. It's quite rare you're going to encounter a type where this happens. But if you ever see dash eq giving false when two objects both represent the same thing, that's because the objects aren't providing a way for PowerShell to compare them properly. To get around this, what I could do is just compare the property p instead. So instead of trying to compare the whole object, I'll just compare property p of the first to what's in property p of the second. And that will, in this case, check if they're the same, as we call it. There is just one more thing I'd like to say about dash eq. Now, I know I said it compares exactly, but there is an exception to that, and that is with strings. When you compare two strings with dash eq, dash eq will ignore the capitals. So, if I ask PowerShell whether lowercase a equals capital A, it will give me true. To say that yes, they do match, because it ignores casing. It's not case sensitive. If you want case sensitive comparison, where it does care about the case, then you can use dash C EQ, where the C stands for case sensitive. Anyway, yeah, that's dash EQ. There are a few more comparison operators too. We also have dash GT and dash LT, which stand for greater than or less than, and they check if the thing on the left is bigger or smaller than the thing on the right. So, if I do 10 dash GT5, that's asking if 10 is greater than 5, which it is, so that will give true. And there's also less than, for asking if the thing on the left is smaller than the thing on the right. And these two are exact. If I ask if 10 is less than 10, it will give false, because 10 is not less than 10. However, if you want to ask whether the thing on the left is less than or equal to the right, then we can write dash le, and this gives true if the thing on the left is less than or or is equal to the right. And there's also dash GE for greater than or equal to. There are also some pattern based operators. These let us compare strings in some very nice ways. The first one is dash like, and we have seen this before. This operator checks if the thing on the left matches the thing on the right, but unlike dash EQ, which just does an exact comparison, ignoring the casing, the thing on the right can have wildcards in it. There are a few different wildcards you can use, and you can put them in the thing on the right, and they essentially allow you to leave blanks in your comparison. So, if I write this, this is asking whether variable s has a string in it with a followed by any characters, I don't care what characters, and then a b after that. We used this earlier in the series on the command get command, which recognizes wildcards in its first parameter. So if I do get dash star, this is saying, give me a command that starts with get dash, and then whatever characters, I don't care what. And there's a few more wildcards like question mark and such, that behave a little differently, but I won't get into that in this series. The documentation is in the description if you want to read about them. There's also a dash match, which is very similar to this, but the thing on the right uses something called regex, regular expressions. Regex is a very common standard way 
of comparing text in really complex ways, and it can get super complicated, it's very powerful. I won't get into regex in this series, it basically needs its own dedicated series, and there are hundreds of places explaining it. It lets you do very complex text comparison. There's also a dash not like and dash not match, which are opposite, like how dash any is opposite to dash eq. Alright, cool, let's wrap up operators quickly now so we can move on to some scripting. There is just one more set of operators I want to cover now, and that is the boolean operators. So, as you'll remember, all of these comparison operators give back booleans, right? Well, there are some operators we can apply to booleans to do certain things with them, and being able to manipulate the booleans we get from these operators can be very useful for us to do more complex conditions. Let me show you. The first operator is exclamation mark, and you write it like this. You write exclamation mark, and then follow it by a boolean. This operator inverts the boolean we give it, meaning true becomes false, and false becomes true. So, if I have a variable with true in it, like, well, I guess the variable true, and I put exclamation mark before it, it will give back false. It flipped the boolean around. Just like a lot of the other operators, it doesn't affect the variable, it gives back a new flipped around boolean. There's also an operator called dash and, and this is quite useful. This operator takes in a boolean on the left and a boolean on the right, and only when the left and the right are true does it give back true. You can see where it got its name. In all other cases, it gives back false. And there's also an operator called dash or, and this gives back true if either the left or the right is true. It gives true if at least one of the two sides are true. So, if the left is true but the right is false, it gives true, because one of them is true. If the right is true but not the left, same thing. If both of them are true, that's still true, at least one of them are true. But, if both are false, that gives false, because not one of them are true. Now, the place we use these two most commonly is in conditions. Let's say I want to make a where that says where the CPU time is greater than 10 and the name matches this wildcard string. Every item has to match both of these things. Both of these things need to give true for an item to be selected. Well, I can do that using the operator dash and. What we're gonna do is on the left of the dash and, we're gonna run dash gt to check if the CPU time is greater than 10. And then on the right of it, we're gonna run dash like to check if the name matches the wildcard string. Now let's say I have this object and it goes into the where to decide whether we want it to be included. Let's see what this does. So, first it does this. Is the CPU time greater than 10? Yes, it is. So that side is going to have true on it, because the dash gt is going to give true there. Alright, cool. Now let's move over to the second side. Does the name follow this pattern? Yes, it does. So both sides of the dash and have true in them. So the dash and sees that both sides gave true, and gives true back because of that. The where then sees that true, and the object is included. But, let's say we changed our object to look like this instead. Now, the name doesn't match the pattern, so let's see what happens now. So, the left side runs, and it checks to see if the CPU is greater than 10. It is, so it gives true. Then we go to the other side. It checks if the name on the object matches the pattern. It doesn't. The name does not match the pattern we got there, so this side gives false. And because they're not both true, the dash and gives false. So hopefully you can see how this dash and here is allowing us to say where one thing and another thing. And only when both things on each side of the and give true, will the dash and give true, and the where will accept the item. Basically, you can use dash and to say and in your conditions. That's basically what it allows you to do. And you can also use or. If you use or, the object needs to either have a CPU greater than 10, or have a name matching this pattern to be accepted. Either side being true will be enough to make it give true, and have the where, or whatever you're using it in, accept the item. Now, in both of these examples here, you'll notice that I wrapped the dash gt and the dash like in brackets, and the reason why I did this is to make sure those run first, and their result definitely gets treated as this single block, this single value that's then handed to dash and. However, if we're being really exact, when it comes to dash and and dash or, 
you can go without the brackets. But why does that work? How does it not get confused and not see it like this or something? What makes PowerShell see it like this when we don't have the brackets and not something weird like this? What makes it see it like that? Well, it all comes down to a concept known as operator precedence. I promise there will be a glossary at the end of this series, don't worry. Certain operators are more important than others, and the more important ones always run first. So, dash GT has more importance than dash AND, which causes it to always run first. Same goes for dash LIKE, and that causes them to behave just like they were wrapped in brackets when put alongside dash AND. You're actually very familiar with operator precedence already from maths. Remember the order of operations, Spodmus, or however you learnt it? Well, that's operator precedence happening right there. Certain things, like times, are more important than plus, and will always run first. So, if I do 3 plus 4 times 5 in PowerShell, PowerShell won't see it like this, it will see it like this, because the times operator is given more precedence, more importance, than plus. The times will always happen first when put alongside a plus. That's just how the operators are treated. And in our case here, Dash GT and Dash Like have more precedence than AND, therefore causing them to run first and then have their results used in the Dash AND. That's by design. They specifically ordered their importance like that to try and make using Dash AND as easy as possible without needing the brackets. However, I personally like having the brackets there. It just makes it really clear to the reader exactly what's happening. I don't even know the operator precedence in PowerShell very well. I just prefer wrapping things in brackets to make it as clear as possible what should be happening first. Instead of trying to memorize what order operators take importance, it's just clearer to see it like this in my opinion. In the description you'll find a list of all the operators and their importance though. There's just one more thing I'd like to mention about operators before we move on. A lot of the operators in PowerShell behave specially when they have a collection on the left of them. When you put a collection on the left of an operator, what PowerShell will usually do is apply that operator to all the items in the collection. For example, if I make an array with these three strings in it, and I write dash like like this, it's going to do this dash like on each item, and it will give back all the items that did match, and most operators will do this. Alright, that's enough on operators, let's get back to scripting. There is a reason I covered operators by the way, and we'll get to that soon. So, here we are in Visual Studio Code, and this is the script we wrote in the last episode. Now, I'd just like to quickly introduce you to a very neat little feature known as comments, which is something that's going to help us out a little bit when making scripts in the future. A comment is a thing we can put in the script that PowerShell completely ignores. PowerShell pays absolutely no attention to it. And we use one to put a message in the script, just to guide anyone reading the script's code if there's anything that needs explaining. To make a comment, you just write a hashtag and that will make the rest of the line a comment. So, if I do this, I can now put absolutely whatever I want after the hashtag, and PowerShell won't pay any attention to it. It's just there as a message to help someone reading the script out. So, I could put a message in here saying, add a line count property to each file object. So now, when someone comes in here to read this script and try and understand what it's doing, they've got this nice little comment here, letting them know what the next bit is doing. So, yeah, a comment is just a message you can put in the script to help someone reading it. You can also put comments at the end of lines like this if you want, and PowerShell will ignore everything after the hashtag. Now, one thing I said I'd mention in the last episode is this Visual Studio Code app we're using. Visual Studio Code is a text editor geared towards programming, and the cool thing is, it has support for PowerShell scripts. If you go onto the Visual Studio Code website and install it, you can then open it up and drag your PowerShell script into it. And then down here in the corner, it will give you an option to install the PowerShell extension, which gives you all of the fancy colouring and suggestions and all of that. And when you install it, you now have the same experience I'm seeing here. 
It's awesome because if I just write something, it pops up with suggestions of what I could want. So, let's say I want the command import CSV. There it is. I'll choose that and it auto fills it in. And it gives me lots of tool tips too. So you'll notice that right here, it's actually telling me all the parameters on the command and what type of object they take in and all that, which is super cool. And I can put my mouse over things and it talks about them. It's great. One thing I want to draw your attention to are these yellow lines. This script has a few of them, and in the last episode, I just ignored them for the time being. But if you get one, you shouldn't ignore it. This yellow underline is what's known as a warning. It's warning me about something right here. Now, when you get a warning about a bit of code, you technically can ignore it. The PowerShell is still valid. This is all valid. It will run and all of that, but the warning is usually telling you about something you could be doing better, or it can sometimes catch things you probably didn't mean to do. For example, if I make a variable and set it to, I don't know, 5, if I don't use that variable anywhere, I'll get a warning telling me that I'm making this variable and they're not doing anything with it. It's letting me know that this line here is pointless. I'm just making the variable for no reason. It will still run, of course, but it's letting me know that doing this is pointless. So, what's this warning about? Well, if I put my mouse over the line, it will tell me what it's warning me about. And it's telling me that percent is an alias, and it's not recommended to use aliases in scripts. And that's actually true. In general, aliases are designed to be used in the command line like this, which is what we've been doing most of the time. But in scripts, it's generally not good practice to use them. You can obviously still do it, it will still work, it's just not recommended. And that's what warnings are all about. So, I'll replace this with for each dash object, which is the full command name. Cool, no more warning. And there are also errors which are red underlines. You'll get an error when PowerShell can't understand your script. For example, let's say I make a hash table and put this in here. Well, this isn't valid, I'm only giving the key. And if we look at the error, we can see it says that it's expecting to see an equals in there to provide the value to. That's how you make hash tables, not this. So, that's an error. It's wrong and it can't understand it. One thing you do need to be aware of is errors you see in here only tell you that PowerShell can't understand your script. It's perfectly possible to have a script PowerShell understands fine, but that crashes or doesn't do what you want. So, just because there are no errors doesn't mean your script will definitely work and that it definitely won't give an error when it tries to actually do the actions you describe. Anyway, with that said, I'd like to introduce something new. And this is the next big topic for this video. We've learned a little bit about scripting, but to be able to really take our scripts to the next level, we need to bring in something called the if statement. This is something built into the PowerShell language that lets you run a block of code only if a condition is true. For example, let's say we want to write a very simple script that goes like this. It asks the user whether they like AB Media. If they enter yes, then it prints out, okay, that's good, you're safe. And if they don't say yes, and they say something else, then it says, I, I don't even know who I'm talking to anymore. So, a pretty simple script, right? But how can we do this, where it changes what it does based on a given thing? How can we do that? Well, we can use an if statement to decide what to run based on a condition. What we're going to do is first print out to the user, do you like AB Media? Then we're going to use read host to get in an answer, and we're then going to use an if statement to say if what they entered was yes, do this, otherwise do this. The way you make an if statement is by writing if, then brackets, and inside these brackets you put in the condition, and after that you put in curly braces like so. And everything you put inside these curly braces will only run if the condition is true. And once the if has run everything in the curly braces, it will go on to run what's after it too. It doesn't stop here or anything. Let's make the script I described. 
If the answer is yes, we're going to print out the sane message. If the answer is not yes, we'll print out the insane message. So what I'm going to do is write if and then brackets. And inside these brackets, we put the condition. If what? If the answer equals yes. And then we put in curly braces. And perfect, that's in this statement right there. If the answer equals yes, then everything inside these curly braces is going to run. So we'll say that if they entered yes, they are sane. Now, notice how I'm putting spaces before this. I briefly mentioned this in the last episode, but didn't actually explain exactly what this is. This is what's known as indentation, and it's something you do in every single programming language. These spaces here mean nothing. PowerShell doesn't pay any attention to them. They don't affect how PowerShell works or anything like that. I could go without them if I wanted, but what the spaces are there for is clarity. Every single time you enter inside a block, so most of the time that's when you go inside curly braces, you push everything inside that block forwards by spaces. You indent everything in the block. And every time you leave a block, so that's the closing curly brace, you unindent again. The reason why we use indentation is it makes it very clear what is inside what. Now, I know it might not be obvious to you right now, but if you put if statements within if statements, which you can do, there's nothing stopping you from doing that, and then you start putting, I don't know, for reaches in here, and all these different things that have stuff inside them, if you pushed everything together, it would start to become extremely difficult to figure out what's inside what. It would just become a complete unreadable mess. So what we do is when you enter inside something, typically with curly braces, you push everything inside that thing forward one more than it was before. You may not see the benefits now, but trust me, do it, and when you start writing much, much more complex scripts, you will see huge improvements to its readability. Visual Studio Code actually indents stuff automatically, so you don't even have to worry about it, it will just space it for you. Alright, great, so if we run what we have now, it's going to ask us the question. And if I enter yes, it will say that yes, I am safe. But if I run it again and don't enter yes, this condition here will be false. The message we entered will not be yes, so what's going to happen is it's going to skip straight over the curly braces. It's going to skip straight to here. Nothing in the curly braces will run. And since this is just the end of the script here, the script will end. So, right now, if I enter something that's not yes, it will just end without saying anything. Obviously, we wanted to say something in that situation too. So how can we do that? Hmm. How about we add a second if? If what they entered was not yes, then we'll print the insane message. So, after or before this if, we're going to say if their input was not equal to yes. And if that's the case, then we'll print the insane message. So now, if the message was yes, this if statement triggers, it will print the message, and then it will carry on. And this if statement is false, so it's not going to run this or any of that. Or, if the message was no, this if statement will not trigger, because it's not equal, it will just go through without doing the things in the curly braces. But this if statement will trigger, because they're not equal. So it will print out the message. So, if we run the script, you can see it works. Now, this works, but there is a much better way to do this. Instead of repeating the exact same if again, wouldn't it be nice if instead we could just say otherwise here? So, if this condition do this, otherwise do this. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just say that? Well, we can. Introducing else. If you put an else straight after the curly braces of an if statement like this, it basically becomes an otherwise to the if statement before it. So what PowerShell sees here is if the text equals yes, run this code, and then hop down to here. But if the text doesn't equal yes, run this here, and then hop down to here. And that's it, there's our script done. This is how you'd write it. Also, just a quick tip, there is actually a prompt parameter on the read host command, and we could use that instead of writing write output. Alright, so there's the script done. 
How about we use this if to do something more complex then? What we're gonna do is make a grade calculator. What you do is you enter in a percentage and PowerShell gives back a letter grade from F to A based on that percentage. If the percentage is above 90%, it will say back, you got A. Yes, very high expectations, I know. If it's above 80%, it will give you, you got B, and so on. So, how can we do this? Well, what we're going to do is use a bunch of ifs checking our input. If it's above 90, we're going to print out you got A. If it's above 80, we're going to print out you got B, and so on. So, let's do that. First, we'll ask the user for their percentage. And we'll put that into a variable, and we'll also cast that into an integer, since it is, after all, a number. And now we need to do a bunch of ifs to print out a different message depending on the percentage. If you'd like, you can pause the video right now and try it out if you want. Feel free to do that, but I'm going to take you through it now. Alright, so let's start with how you might think you do it. This is not necessarily the right way to do it, just how you may think you do it. So, what we're going to do is make one if statement for each grade. One if statement checks if the grade is greater than 90 and prints A if so. Another checks if the grade is greater than 80 and prints B if so, and so on. So let's do that. Let's just start with grade A, I guess. Why not? So, if the percentage is above or equal to actually, let's do greater than or equal to, 90. It's going to say, you got grade A. Great, on to the next if statement. This is for the next grade down, the B grade. If the user got above or equal to 80%, we're going to print, you got B. Now that we've got grade B, let's do grade C, which is if it's greater than or equal to 70. And let's do D as well. And what about grade U, which is everything below 60%? Well, we're just going to put an if statement at the end here, saying if it's less than 60, we're going to print grade U. Great, so this is our script here. Now let's run it and see if it works, shall we? Okay, so it asks us for a grade. Let's enter 50. And it says, correctly, that we got grade U. Great! I mean, the grade isn't, but that is correct. But let's try out the others, make sure it handles them correctly. Let's try the grade 92. So, we enter it in and, whoa, what's going on here? Hmm, yeah, this is definitely not right. So, the question is, why is it doing this? Well, let's take a look at the script. And what we're going to do is imagine we were PowerShell reading the script. And let's see what happens line by line when we enter 92. In the next episode, I'm going to show you something very cool that's going to help us do this imagining a lot easier. But for now, we'll stick to doing this. So, imagining percentage was 92, let's go through line by line and envision what it's going to do. So first, it asks whether the percentage is greater than 90. It is, it's 92. Okay, so it prints grade A. That's correct. That's what we want it to print. And then, if we keep going through, we'll see it then gets to this line. This line asks whether it's greater than 80, and it is technically yes. It is above 80, it's 92. So it also runs this. I think you can see the problem here. Then it goes on to this line, and yet again, it is above 70. So it prints this one out too, and so on. It doesn't print the U at least, because it isn't below 60. So this one isn't affected and is fine, but all the rest are affected. What we want it to do is only print grade A, not do all of this. So how can we solve this? Well, what we need to do is somehow only run all these conditions, these conditions for the smaller grades, if the grade is not greater than 90. So that way, it starts by asking whether the grade is greater than 90. And only if it's not, does it then start to look at these. To do that, we can add an else to this if, and put all the other ifs into that else. So now, if it's greater than 90, we print this, and that's it, we just print this. But if it's not greater than 90, then we're going to check for the lower grades. So putting these into the else avoids it doing all these ifs when it's just a grade A. Now, we also need to do the same for grade B. We're going to handle grade B, and only if it's not grade B are we then going to check grade C and D. And the same goes for grade C. We're going to check for grade C, and only if it's not grade C are we then going to check for grade D. And this works as expected. And I'm going to show you interactively exactly why it works in the next video, in case you don't already get it. Because I'm going to show you something very exciting next time 
called the debugger. It's a really cool tool that's going to be so valuable for you to help find bugs and issues in scripts. It basically lets you watch your code run line by line and watch it make all the decisions with the ifs and such. It's super useful and we'll take a look at that in the next episode and watch this script here run. See it working perfectly. Also, one thing that's really bugging me about this script is how ugly it looks. Just look at all this. It's so, ugh. It's so messy and ugly. But there is one PowerShell feature we can use that lets us do this else and this if in one. And that will make this extremely neat. And we'll find out about that in the next video. Bye.